So today we have an amazing guest joining us, Mr. David Hunter. He's been a contrarian investor, global macro investor for the past 40 plus years. So quite literally double my lifetime age. And it's been uh, so there's a tremendous amount of wisdom and knowledge and expertise with us today. And I'm really, really excited to have David on board with us and discussing what really needs to be discussed throughout financial markets, throughout the global macro economy. So David, thank you again for coming on. I'm looking forward to the talk. Sure. Thanks, Max. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And so with that being said, I'd really love to start by you know, having you discuss your background, your journey, going all the way back to investing to Wall Street. Um, you know, how did it start and how has you know, that process till currently, um, what does it look like for you? Sure. Um, yeah, I've been in this uh, 47 years. I came right out of college back in 1973 and started in a, a bank investment department, um, spent uh, eight years in banking, running both uh, bank portfolios, which is mostly bonds and trust portfolio, which is mostly stock. Um, and then from there, uh, was a pension manager, got hired by um, Textron, which is Fortune 100 company, to run their equity pension funds. And that was back in the early 80s. I uh, had top one percentile numbers from five years running there um, and went from there to uh, some other uh, like Fidelity. And, and I, I ran the active uh, equity desk for or department for ITT Hartford. So you know, kind of a, a myriad of jobs on the buy side. And then the last half of my career has been as a, a macro strategist. And that's what I do today. Um, you know, people can find me if they so choose uh, on Twitter typically um, is where I hang out the most. And that's uh, my, my handle is at Dave H Contrarian. Um, and people are welcome to come there I also put out a, um, a macro letter that comes out quarterly that's offered by subscription. Excellent. And speaking of your Twitter, whom I happen to follow quite religiously, um, you, you always typically, not always, but typically come out with forecasts and sometimes they're updated um, depending on what the market gives you. And I thought I'd share with some of your more recent targets that I have noted here. And it, most recently, you've talked about the Dow potentially going to thirty-seven thousand. You know, you've talked about silver going to forty to forty-five dollars an ounce. Um, of course, you've talked about the sharp decline in the dollar, sharp prices and sharp rise in prices in crude. So, if you could take us, whether it's individually in those um, asset classes or as a bucket, an aggregate. Can you explain your analytical framework behind these forecasts um, and how it kind of reached to these conclusions? Sure. Well, as a, as a macro strategist, I, I am very much top down. So a lot of it's driven by, um, you know, my, my look at the economy, both here and abroad, um, as well as, you know, monetary policy, fiscal policy, et cetera. Um, back in, in March, uh, I think I was pretty alone in, in when, when we had the three week swoon where the market dropped 35% or close to 35% in three weeks. Um, everybody turned bearish and was looking lower. And I said, no, I think we're likely to um, head into all time highs and ultimately a melt up. And I was using, I think 4,200 to 4,500 as my S&P target back then. Um, I've since adjusted it to 4,600 recently. Um, and I'm not even sure that'll be the, the top. We could, we could exceed that by a little bit, but basically the view was we were in the 38th year of a secular bull market that would end in, end in a parabolic blow off, uh, parabolic melt up. And that's what I think we're in right now. So I think we could cover an awful lot of ground in the next two or three months that could take us right to the top. Uh, so as you're, you know, as a life, you know, what's life like being a contrarian? It must be, I mean, you're against the herd. You're against virtually everybody, the majority. 
Yeah, my my and I've dealt, developed my style over you know forty seven years, so I'm very comfortable with being a contrarian. But I was actually um, probably was born with a contrarian uh, strain in me because I I found it easy to go against the crowd even way back early in my career. Obviously, the more years you get in, the more confidence and conviction you have with that um, ability to go against the crowd. But you know the the basic premise on that is that at turning points, particularly both bottoms and tops. Um, at tops, the majority of people are bullish, and at bottoms, the majority of people are, are bearish. And if you can reverse that at the turning points, at the inflection points, uh, you're going to be a lot better off. So when, when everybody's bearish, I want to be bullish, typically. And, when, and, and again, I don't knee jerk it. I'm not, I don't say, okay, everybody's here. I want to be here. It's usually my, my forward-looking fundamentals will, will agree with, um, you know, my my contrarian view so um it makes it for me um easy but again it's not it's not that easy when when everybody is on one side um it's not a you start questioning gee am i right you know could could i be that right and but it is uh where i think people misunderstand a contrarian or at least the way i approach it is there there are chunks of time in the middle where i'm i'm willing to go with the consensus so I get I get beat up on Twitter sometimes where people say you're not a contrarian you're everybody else is bullish just like you, and I go yeah but they weren't back in March and you know um, there's a period of time where consensus is actually right where you want to stay with the with the move um, at some point up near the top I'm probably going to be turning the other way and people are going to be calling me you know wrong you know you're yeah. you're too premature in your bearishness so. Um, it kind of comes with the territory that you're typically going to be second guessed at those turning points because you're totally against what the crowd behavior is. And I will tell you, through 47 years of studying this, um, the vast majority of people, whether they realize it or not, are most comfortable in a crowd. They they don't like to be you know out away from the crowd. So so you know it's a small percentage of people that are just naturally willing to kind of uh, march to their own drummer. And uh, so it's, again, that's part of psychology is most people are going to want to be with the crowd whether they realize it or not. Right. So with, with that being said, do you have a lot of emphasis on the behavioral finance side of things rather than, or the psychology of things rather than the actual data-driven factors that comprise, you know, different possible conclusions? Sure. Yeah, it's it's a um, kind of it's a piece of it for sure. Um, I I do look at fundamentals a lot. I look at technicals a lot, but sentiment and the psychology of the market is a very important piece of this. Um, I learned early on. I read a book um, uh, which was uh, the psychology of the stock market, I think, or something such as that, by David Dreeman, who was a long time contrarian who has since passed away, but um, he, uh, I read it back in probably 1977, I think when the book came out. And like I said, I was already kind of there anyway, but it just spoke my language. And it was very much about how important it is to understand that psychology is a very big part of how markets um, act and react. So um, I think everybody should at least be aware that psychology is is a big piece of of how how markets move absolutely and so in specific if we go into specifics here I, I wanted to talk specifically about the dollar because you know on this show and specifically in particular i talk a lot about the dollar and you know i do i do believe too that we'll see a sharp decline in the value of the dollar relative to all other currencies and when you measure things in gold things look like a lot more sense. Uh, things are priced in a much more sensible way. Um, and, you know, and I, when you look at like the Bloomberg Commodities Index, you know, price in equities, it's that bucket is the cheapest it's ever been, arguably. Um, so when you look at these kinds of factors pertaining to the value of the dollar, um, what do you look at? Do you look at the hockey stick shape in M1? Do you look at, you know, the money multiplier, the velocity of money? Um, what specifically do you look at? 
Yeah, frankly, I mean, I was bearish on the dollar when it was 104. And again, uh, it was pretty contrary call back then. Almost everybody had the view that, um, you know, the world was short dollars and the dollar was going higher. And I was ridiculed for having a bearish view that said back when it was 103, 104, that we could go to uh, 85. You know, people thought I was crazy. So mm -hmm. here we are at, you know, 91. And uh, it had actually fallen below 90 not long ago. Um, and now I've got plenty of company saying, oh, yeah, the dollar can go down. So, um, uh, you know, there were a lot of things that went into it. The technicals, uh, the currencies are very much a technical market. So the technicals there, I saw um, sentiment, which is, again, as a contrarian, plays a big role for me. As I said, everybody was on the other side of it. So that, that uh, was part of it. And also, I, you know, I had a bearish view of where we were heading in terms of the economy um, and knew that at some point the Fed was going to probably take the lead in terms of how much um, easing that would be done. So relative to a Bank of England or an ECB or a Bank of Japan, um, I felt we were moving into a period where you know we have more capacity to print than any of them. So that means you're you're supplying an excess of of dollars versus relative to these other currencies, and that was going to put pressure on on the dollar. And then of course interest rates. Um, you know I was a pretty big bull on bonds, and and you know expected rates to fall dramatically. So that that helped. Um, the bearish case on the dollar as well. Absolutely. It's just so interesting because you see, I mean, I mean, we've had a 10% or so decline in DXY 2020. Some argue that's, wow, that's a huge, I mean, inflation, inflation, inflation. Others say that's not a huge drawback uh, than people were expecting anyways. Um, you know, there's a huge supply zone at where it's currently trading, like you said, um, it's trading at like the 91 handle. And, but what I find interesting about it is most of the trade weighted dollar is comprised of the euro, but um, the amount of net shorts on the US dollar, frankly, I th correct me if I'm wrong, has never been seen before in terms of its satur There's almost, there's hundreds of thousands of contracts short the US dollar, and it's, it's such a huge um, saturation. But yeah, for sure. There's there's definitely right now um, a I think a building consensus that we're down at the level where the dollar could turn, that we're you know at the bottom of a um, a channel, and that um, the euro is pushing the top of the channel or a trend line, and and uh, you know I can see that. I certainly understand that's a possibility. I don't think that's likely. I think that's become you know, a popular view right now, uh, popular narrative. Um, it's possible you could have a, you know, further uh, climb in the dollar before it rolls back over. But I, I really do feel we're not at the end of this sell off. And uh, uh, frankly, I don't think this is more anything more than just a, a bit of a counter trend uh, trade that will reverse downward pretty quickly. Um, and, and, you know, on the corollary is obviously, I think the the euro's heading higher. I've got a, a 130 versus a dollar um, type of uh, target on that. So, so I, you know, again, it's not something that I think is long and sustainable. Uh, ultimately, I think the dollar reverses back up. Once we get down to 85, it could get down to 84, or, you know, somewhere between 84 and 86. But, um, but uh, you know, I, I just think we still have that 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 last leg down before we we reverse it okay great and well not great but, um, <laughs> you, um so going back to your expertise i mean like we've already established you've been around for so many debt crises so many um you know areas of financial repression and so if we go back to volcker i mean do we see that possibility going forward in terms of inflation do we see that 1970s inflation yeah keep in mind volcker was was the guy that came in to fix the inflation problem because 
G. William Miller, who had been chairman under Jimmy Carter, made such a mess of it and inflation broke out. And, you know, we all of a sudden saw 15, 20% inflation rates and 15% interest rates, 15, 20% interest rates. So um, what was happening was G. William Miller was, was targeting rates and rates were moving up, but he was, um, and so he thought he was tightening because rates were moving up, but he was keeping rates from moving up too fast by printing money. Uh, and that printing of money was pouring fuel on an already heating up, overheating economy. And all of a sudden you got the inflation blow off that um, caused, uh, you know, real panic in the streets and a lot of problems. Um, and Volcker was brought in um, and he switched it from a rate targeting policy to a, I'm gonna let rates go wherever they may, I'm, I'm targeting money. I'm gonna, I'm gonna clamp down on money supply because the money's you know, the fuel to the fire and I've got to control the fuel. So, so um, what we saw was it took a couple of years of really tough medicine and rates went from, you know, they were kind of held, they had been up at 9%, I think in the past, but had never really broken beyond that. Once Volcker came in, they broke above nine, you know, they went from nine to 15 you know, on the long bond very quickly. And meaning over, I can't remember how many months, but over several months uh, rather than several years. And that was just, I mean, we'd never been in that territory before. Inflation had never been up in the high double digits in, in America before. So it was, you know, it was a real shock to the system. Uh, we went through a double dip recession, of course, you know, 1980 was where the medicine really took hold. Then we, you know, the central bank uh, reacted to that and we came back out of it for a short period of time and then went back in and had a, you know, tough 1982. So it was, you know, really one recession from 80 to 82 with an interruption in between. That's not that dissimilar from the, what I think is gonna happen here, which is we had, you know, the swoon last second quarter after the pandemic hit, you know, we shut down the economy here and abroad. Um, you know, you had a, a record breaking decline in the economy in the second quarter, but we also had this unprecedented response from the Fed and the, you know, the uh, government. And so you came back out of it in the third quarter very strongly and you know, not so strongly in the fourth quarter. Um, but I think that's what you're gonna see is similar to 8082, ultimately it's all what I will call all one bust that started in March. Um, but there, it's you know, there's an interruption in between of several quarters because of the, the monetary and fiscal response. So I, you know, that kind of gives away my view that coming up here later this year, I think we have the second shoe drop on a global bust and what I call global deflationary bust because I think we're gonna see uh, the first widespread um, deflationary downturn since the Great Depression. Wow, that does not sound too good, but I mean, it's certainly a possibility, one that I tend to agree with. Um, it's certainly, the amount of excess reserves that are circulating, and it's funny because we don't know anything about the shadow banking system, you know, the, the euro dollar system, because I, it's potentially, you know, 10, 20 times the size um, of our economy, and we don't even know about it. Uh, so that kind of stuff certainly concerns me, and I think it will take a direct hit on consumer prices rising, you know, parabolically, and um, you know, lower wages, completely lower wages. Um, but I, I also had a follow-up question is, you know, how do you feel on jobs going forward? Because we've recently seen, um, you know, non-farm payrolls going negative. We've seen a deceleration and the overall trend from, well, it looks like it's about a rebound, but now people are really starting to, you know, reclaim. They're starting to just look for jobs. They can't find jobs. Um, so how does that look going forward? Yeah, well, the part, part of the problem and part of, part of the reason a lot of people um, that don't do this for a living get confused is because there's leads and lags to this stuff. You know, last, last summer, um, basically July, August, 
the Fed backed off on on the easing. You know, they pulled money out of the system. So um, they put a few trillion in, and they took a few hundred billion back out. And during that pause, and it was a legitimate pause, they weren't sure whether they had overdone it. You know, things were really starting to come back pretty fast. And, you know, there is a, a long lag time to when policy kicks in and you don't want to, by the time you find out that you've overdone it, it's too late. So, so I think they were being a little cautious and saying, we, we want to step back and take a look at things before we do more. Um, and it was that pause with a lag added on to it you know, that is getting us to where we are, you know, late last year and early this year where, you know, jobs are slowing down, you know, unemployment's going up again. Um, and of course, there's plenty of people and, and small businesses that never recovered. So that's all still there. But at the margin, you're getting a slowdown for sure after a very strong third quarter, a slower fourth quarter, maybe a, you know, slower first quarter. But they're already, particularly on the fiscal side, coming back the other way. And don't forget, that's the other thing. We had a lot of fiscal response, um, you know, last spring and summer. But then they sat on their hands from, you know, from June till late December. So, you know, the unemployment, the additional unemployment that the federal government was providing went away. Um, you know, the relief checks that could have come earlier, you know, if they had done it in September, we probably wouldn't have seen the slowdown in the fourth quarter, but because of politics, a lot of stuff didn't happen until late in the year. And then it was, you know, much smaller numbers than we had had in previous, uh, the previous program. So, you know, there's, there's been kind of a, um, I, I think on the part of the government's um, response, a bit of a, underestimating just how hard this pandemic is hitting, you know, the economy and people. And it's it's hard because as you well know, there's a Zoom economy, there's a, you know, there's a lot of people doing very well. And then there's, you know, probably 20 million people, 10 of which are unemployed and, and another 10 that are underemployed that are doing very poorly, don't know where their next meal's coming from or don't know if they can, you know, when they're going to be able to pay their mortgage again or their, their rent. So, so we've got a very bifurcated economy. And, and part of our problem is um, the, the people in charge of determining what, what should be done fiscally have never missed a paycheck. You know, they get paid no matter what they do, you know, meaning the politicians. And so they sit on their hands and talk, talk a nice game and say, well, we're, you know, we think we're we're being fiscally, you know, particularly Republicans, we think we're being fiscally responsible. We don't want to be pouring money out there that we can't pay for. Well, you know, tell that to the 10 million people that don't know where their next meal is coming from. So, so we've got a real problem because this is, you know, this pandemic is something we've never faced before, or certainly not in modern times. And um, I think ultimately, uh, we're we're going to see that they're going to have to. It's pay me now or pay me later. You can sit on your hands. You can, you can haircut or whatever. Ultimately, a bust is going to hit us. The second, what I call a second shoe dropping or the second phase of the bust, is going to be bigger than the first. And you know the the amount of fiscal and monetary response that will come in response to that will be off the charts. It'll be well beyond what anybody's thinking right now. So, so it's kind of, you know, it's more timing thing uh, in terms of they, you know, they can fight it now, meaning in this case, Republicans more, but there's also, and I'm not saying Democrats aren't guilty here. They were very guilty of sitting on their hands uh, to deny Trump a package back in October. So, so both parties really let the American public down during that, uh, you know, during the last several months, um, but ultimately, uh, it'll, as always happens, um, it'll, most of the response will come in reaction to a problem, not in anticipation of that problem. Absolutely. I think one of the root causes of that is just the pure incentive that these politicians, all in all, their one incentive only, in my opinion, is just to win the next election. I, that, I think that's for sure part of it. 
I will tell you, though, and I beat up on the Republicans plenty, but I will tell you that we, we have a budget um, deficit and debt that is so far beyond anything we've ever seen in history. And they are trying, even though they aren't very consistent with it. Right now, they are worried about the excess spending. And, and in fairness, there is a lot of money that gets allocated and then it doesn't get spent you know, in a, in a quick way. And then they want to come back with another package when they haven't even put the, the last 900 billion out there. Um, so so it, it does become not, you know, from an outsider standpoint, you can be a cynic and say, yeah, they're all about just getting reelected. But in fairness, um, you do want some fiscal responsible, fiscally responsible people down there pushing back and saying, we, you know, this money doesn't grow on trees. You, you think it does. You think all you have to do is tell the Fed to print some more money and that it's free. You know, it's a free lunch. It's not. Down the road, we're going to have to pay this back. And it's not, I don't know where it's going to come from. Right. The debt has to be paid back eventually. All right. David Hunter, everyone. Unfortunately, you know, in terms of time here, we kind of have to cut it here. But, you know, I wish I could talk to you for longer and longer, but maybe we could schedule another time and talk again. Um, but in the meantime, let's call it here. And David Hunter, um, if you want to remind everyone where they could follow you on Twitter um, and any other information where our viewers can view your work and opinions and forecasts, that would be great. Sure. Um, my Twitter handle is at Dave H. Contrarian. Uh, and if anybody's interested in my letter, uh, like I said, it's by subscription, so it's not a freebie. Um, they can uh, direct message me on Twitter and, and I'll respond to them there. Excellent. And like I said, we'll have all that information right in the description below the video. And with that being said, David Hunter, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it a lot. Yeah, thanks, Mac Max. It's been a pleasure. All right. Take care. Take care.